So there could be a lot of people asking the question today, well, I've listened to so much of Ravi Zacharias's material. I've got so many of his books. Mm -hmm. like, and some of these other leaders that, that we've mentioned, I have some of their books in my life. One of them's Lord, Please Change My Attitude, written by a man who had a real problem with his attitude. You know, and it became glaringly obvious and he was dismissed for it. And I'm thinking, well, he was preaching this and he was writing about this, but it wasn't happening in his own life. What do we do with that? What do you recommend that we do with books and material that were produced by these leaders who have taken the fall morally? What do you recommend? Um, it doesn't exactly answer the question, but I, I, I cannot... <laughs> yeah, I keep going back to the story of Balaam in Numbers 22. It just, uh, it just seems to have come up for me uh, of a, we don't know if, this, if Balaam wa it was a God follower, a Jehovah follower. We don't know really his background, but he was called on to curse the Israelites who were coming into the land by a pagan king. And... Um, uh, although Balaam stands up to those kings initially, he, he waffles back and forth to where God uses a donkey to keep him <laughs> out of trouble. But ultimately, um, Balaam, was he a, an opportunist or was he a follower of God? We don't know. But ultimately, God's message got delivered. And it was true Regardless, chagrin, right? <laughs> regardless of who delivered it, it was truth right. that was delivered. Yeah. And um, I, I keep thinking about it. each person's going to have to make their own personal choice. Yeah. Um, I've got a number of Ravi's bo books, um, Jesus Among Other Gods. You know, some of them are classics. Mm -hmm. They're just full of helpful truth. Do I throw it in the trash? Uh, I'm not going, but me personally, I'm not going to. They're great. What's true in them is true. doesn't matter who wrote it. Well, I say it doesn't matter. I, I know you got an issue. issue. Yeah, it matters who wrote it, but it's still true. Rebuttal, Bobby? <laughs> no, echoing, I mean, the, you, you, this is a matter that requires discernment. It does. Yeah, and, and it's it something does. to think about. And I could see, I, I found myself in thinking about some of this, just kind of arguing with myself, different mm. sides of this thing. And, and and there's probably, as you were talking about that, it does seem to me that there, I could see you a difference. Listening, you between, were listening? No, no. I, were, I, okay. I took, <laughs> I took this away from you. <laughs> I could see a difference between you consulting and reading something for your um, provoking reflection and, and thinking. Um, versus saying, hey, this is a book I'd recommend. And, you know, in the same way that you may feel reservation about recommending um, the ministry in general. You know, so one of the things that RZIM will obviously be re undergoing is rebranding or shutting the d doors or whatever they end up deciding. The reason is a lot of this misconduct. And um, so I, I do, it, it's tough. I, I think about the lives affected by that. And so what gives me pause is just thinking through, could I share this material with someone know, who is intimately aware of his behavior and mistreatment of people, the abuse of power? Um, I don't want to take that lightly. And so, and this is, as I think through it, I'm kind of like everybody needs to read C.S. Lewis anyway, so maybe we just recommend Lewis's material instead. C.S. Um, Lewis also taught purgatory, yeah, and was very clear that Christians should not be marrying divorced yeah. people, and yet he married Joy yeah. Gresham and yeah. was divorced. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, and, and so it would be very, <laughs> I would like, if you want to get a scale, I'm okay with that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, and it's, it's a, um, I, I mentioned, I, I had written down, I, I have um, one of the books that Ravi regularly talked about was Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray. Yes, and he mentioned Oscar that. Wilde was yeah. no Puritan, right? Yeah. And, and I've, I've got, I've read that book a couple of times, right? Mm -hmm. and, and just thinking through um, the points that Ravi brought from that kind of material, one yeah. of Ravi's like, strengths, if you will, was was having Christians going through and, and interacting with the mindset of those outside of the faith and learning from that. And so maybe there's a there's a healthy sense in which you can be can, can be doing some of that. Um, 
I just, for me, I, there is a, this is kind of, I could go on about this for a bit, but just thinking through the worrying about a way of, of disconnecting someone's words from their actions. And so it, it, that's, a, that's the, I know that like when someone writes a book, it kind of carries a life of its own in that respect. And so it can be, it's easier for me to envision that standing alone and being evaluated and critiqued on that, on that basis. But like, especially um, now your conduct has, it's going to have a very big impact on that mm -hmm. ministry and how it goes forward. And so I'm kind of like, maybe this is maybe not necessarily rational, but an emotional kind of sense when I look through these books and I'm like, I, I see the name and I think about the behavior. Um, at minimum, I would encourage anyone to re who reads these books that they should not be surprised if there were things that we missed in terms of like, you know, um, I freely admit to having blinders on when I read Lewis. He could do no wrong. But as, as we go in through and reading his material, um, seeing seeing the warts along with, with everything else, and um, it's just that I, I do think he, in his conduct, Robbie in particular, took things to another level. And that's that's probably where triage is, is involved there. Is yes. where. And, and I think you make a good point. There's different uses for the books for personal reference. You know, right. I still have some of these, and I will continue to use them in my own study. Um, whenever, but if to, to hand a book out or to recommend a book publicly, um, again, a matter of conscience, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's case by case. You know, how much does this, how much is this person going to be exposed to other materials by, by the same author or something like that? But, you know, if you present a book, do it with a caveat, right? Um, here's what has happened because some people could be significantly impacted if they're reading a book and then all of a sudden they discover that this man was wrapped up in scandal the glaring hypocrisy that is there could really negate everything that they've read from the book or something like sure. that so we need to be available and willing to be able to answer that and again you know my faith is not contingent upon any other humans behavior in any way uh, because my faith is not in another human. My faith is in Jesus Christ. Uh, these leaders had a tremendous way of representing Jesus Christ in the things that they taught, albeit their behavior was not in line with that. Um, and that's not, a, it's not an across-the-board statement. I mean, uh, it, they, they fell into the trap, the, the snare of sin, right? And every person needs to recognize that that is something that we need to be aware of on a daily basis. It's true of each of us individually. So let, let's, on that note, let's move to addressing the issue of the, of the believer. Um, the, looking at this from the perspective of the individual believer, the Christian. What does this mean for me? If, if somebody like Jerry Falwell Jr., president of a large Christian university, or James McDonald, or other pastors of a church, or Ravi Zacharias, and who was a model, seemed to be a picture of integrity, right? If this can happen to him, how do I know it's not going to happen to me? I'm sure that's a question that's going through a lot of people's minds. Are we simply left at the mercy of circumstance? Well, I might not end up getting in the same situations that they did. Maybe they just ended up in situations where it was beyond their capacity to resist or something like that. Um, the way you asked that, that's a, that's a great way to frame it. Are we left to the uh, to the uh, to circumstances? Are we victims of that? And uh, I think we would answer absolutely, you know, absolutely not. Each of us makes choices, daily choices, every step along the way, and every one of those has consequences. Um, there was a great qu uh, a question here: Can the gospel really change people? Um, I, I thought that was a that was a great question, and it reminded me of the power of the gospel that uh, Paul talks about in so many places. Because you got to remember, this man was. Uh, uh, he was the he was the cream of the cream when it came to to um, uh, persecution, uh, blasphemy. He calls himself the most vile of all vile, wicked people. It, it, I, I stood at the top of the pile, mm -hmm. and yet I love what he says in First Timothy. Uh, this saying is trustworthy and deserving. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I'm the worst. But I receive mercy for this reason, so that in me the worst of them. Christ might demonstrate his extraordinary patience 
as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. So you've got as that sanctifying work of God in my life. It's, it's a cooperation process that I do. Yeah. So, so we face temptation every day, don't we? Every one of us does. So is it, is it just a matter of God's will, whether or not I fall into one of these traps? Or, or what? Well, and, and the Lord gives us the means of grace of the kinds of things that we talked about. So we, I think when we talk about things like accountability and, and what leadership, with regard to leadership especially, but then in the church more generally, these are gifts that God has given to us, um, the, the, the public worship, the celebration of the ordinances, that the life of the church in itself is a means of grace that God has given to us. And I'm reminded of that, you know, the really silly story about the guy that's on the top of the house and the floods and begging for rescue. Three different forms of rescue come, and he's like, you know, the Lord left me hanging, you know, and God's like, I sent you three different. So I, I, that's, the, that's the thing, too, is just availing ourselves of the means of grace to, to help us to walk with God, the things that God has given to us for doing that. Um, so, no, it very much would say that it's, it's not... It's not just a matter of fate, right? Mm -hmm. that, that we have we have clear paths of wisdom given to us, and the Proverbs are full of this kind of thing, where just these are practices that God has given to His people to be to where they can be the kind of people that are drawing from the, the spring, the well of life that is, that is in Jesus Christ. I think that is a very, very clear emphasis in the first nine chapters of Proverbs. And anybody listening to this, following along, uh, if you're struggling with this, I would strongly recommend you read the first nine chapters of Proverbs because there's so much in there. Wisdom is, wisdom is calling. Wisdom is calling, right? And there are so many things that can lure us away and draw us in, but we don't have to listen to them. And I believe this is talking to someone who is a follower of God, right? But an, an, inappropriate, an inappropriate response to this could be, well, we're all sinners. It happened to him. It could happen to me. I'm just, I'm just human. Yeah. Why is that not okay to say? I, the, the, grace, the grace of God as seen in the cross is not cheap. You know, mm -hmm. and we belittle that if we, you know, how can we who who died to sin live any longer therein? I yeah. mean, it's just like we, grace is something to be celebrated and cherished. Yeah. And, and that, you know, faith is properly understood is just submitting to that. It's, it's, the, it's the gracious, it's the inclination of the will yeah. to trust God for who He says. And, and that has a real world impact on us. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when we sin, you know, that, that we have the means of confession, repentance, restoration, just like, like, like the spring coming down after a cold winter, it, it, is, it, is, it is so rewarding to be a Christian. And that, that mindset, this is worlds away from, you know, the kind of blanket indifference. Fatalism. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm just going to do what yeah. I'm going to do. I'm just yeah. human. Yeah. There, there's no indication of that in Scripture that, it, that we are victims of of our own sinful nature. We're, mm. we're, it, it, it's excused because you're just gonna do that because we're just human. We're, there's a recognition that we sin. Uh, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all righteousness. And First John, so much of it being in the present tense, the act of the sense of, if someone says they have no sin, they make God out to be a liar. Um, so we, we recognize that, but along with that, at, at the same equal level is that I do not want you to stay at this place. I yeah. want you to grow and mature and you have the Holy Spirit within you to move you and to keep plotting you He along, redeemed us along. for this purpose. Yes. Yes, yeah. to be a, a holy and a chosen people. Yeah. So to represent that. Yeah. And, and that's why this, you know, uh, I, I, I'm reminded of our need as a church to have the space to like push a step back and it's bewildering as in our initial conversations about some of this. It's just like there's space for just grief here, lament. And I was reminded of, in Paul when he's like, you ought in this particular case of, of sexual immorality within the church body, you ought to have mourned. You ought, this ought to have just grieved your heart that this was, was tolerated and accepted and, and considered okay in your church body. That the more, because 
this loss is our loss in this respect. The, the lives of those outside of Christ that were affected, the blaspheming that will happen, this is something that affects our own ministry. And, and our aim, which is the glory of Christ, is, is affected. It's made more difficult by this. And so how much more to mourn over my own sin? You know, in, in, in public and in, in communication that I, I am gripped by my own part in mm. contributing to this holy people. You know, in Christ we are reconciled to God, and, and that, is a, that is a relational term, right? Because when, I've, when I was not in Christ, I was alienated from God. I was not in relationship with Him. But through Christ's redeeming work, He has reconciled me to God. To what end? But to enjoy God. Hmm. To walk with Him and to enjoy Him. How many times throughout Scripture does God liken His relationship with His people to a marriage relationship. Yeah. So take a take a husband and wife for example, and they're they're living together and they're doing they're busy and I've seen it happen so many times. He's doing this for her, she's doing this for him, but it's all the routines of the day, right? And they're they're doing what's expected of them. And 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 yet in the busyness of their daily lives, they are drifting apart. Even though they're staying busy, they're drifting apart. I've seen it happen, and I've seen many of those end up in divorce, even those who were in Christian ministry because they were so busy, right? And yet they're drifting apart. They were kind of living separate lives, even though they were so busy, right? And, and doing what was expected of them to do. But see, a relationship is not just doing what you're expected to do. Yeah. Right? How many times have I said, if I bring flowers home for Andrea and she's so thankful for them and I say, well, it's what I had to do because I'm your husband, you know? <laughs> and then, I, you know, she smacks me in the face with them, right? And it's like, and, and, yeah. and all of its moral beauty has left. And, yeah. and that's not a relationship, right? And, and as I've said before, we can be very busy for God. So take these leaders that we've talked about, all of them, extremely busy doing good work very, very busy, but it became very, very clear that they could not have been walking with God, even in the busyness of their ministry. Their lives betrayed that, right? Because Jesus said, John, John writes this, abide in him, whoever abides in him does not sin. It's a powerful verse. It's, it's, and it's an absolute negative. That is, in fact, the best translation yeah. of that line, right? Some of your translations might not say that, but the best translation of it, 1 John 3, 6 and 9, whoever abides in him does not sin. Now, that doesn't mean we're all capable of sinless perfection, but the point is that I'm either abiding in him or am I am following a sinful pattern or a sinful thought. But the two are mutually exclusive. You can't be doing both at the same time. And for so many of us, we, we, and you touched on this before, we misunderstand our walk with God to be all the things I'm doing for God. Right. Ravi was very busy. James McDonald, type A personality, unstoppable, right? president of a large Christian university. I'm sure his schedule was extremely full. Very, very busy men, but they weren't walking with God. And this is, this is the hope that you and I have in anybody listening and all Christians. What is it that Paul says? Walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the passions of the flesh. That's the hope that we have. It's not about me simply trying harder to be better or making sure that every day I'm just making the right decisions, although that's important. But am I walking with God? Because I have been redeemed by Christ and reconciled to God so that I can know Him and love Him and enjoy Him and delight in Him. And if I am delighting in Him and loving in Him, I am not going to be drawn to these lesser things thinking that they're going to satisfy me. I need to find my satisfaction in the one who made me and redeemed me, who is my highest good and my deepest satisfaction. That's where I need to be labor intensive. That's what we're called to. And we have the ability, the resource to be able to do that because 
we've been reconciled to God. That's the gospel of grace. That's why Paul says in Colossians 2, he talks about, you know, the Colossians, he says, he says, you submit yourself to regulations. Don't handle, don't touch, don't taste. He says, all of these things, according to the human precepts and teachings, they indeed have an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. What a powerful statement that is. And then he goes on to say in chapter 3, if you've been raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. What are the things that I am pursuing, even at the level of my thoughts and desires? What is it I'm pursuing? That's a question we each need to ask. And we need to honestly ask that of ourselves. We need to honestly ask that of each other as we are walking together in a Godward direction. That's a key part of a culture of discipleship, yeah. just regularly bringing people back to that. A culture of discipleship and a community of grace. That's what yeah. a community yes. of grace yeah. does. Yeah. Yeah. We are walking together in a Godward direction because none of us is designed to just do it alone. Right. 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 We, are, we are baptized into the body of Christ mm -hmm. and we desperately need each other. So we so need the church. We need the church because we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. We need our family, and we need the family. And, and this is what will keep us focused on Christ and, and keep us rescued from the bane distractions and temptations that would draw us away from Him, even though we might be very busy doing good things, church things, spiritual things, if you will. But it's my, it's my walk with God, my pursuit of Him, my delight in Him, my satisfaction in Him that is going to rescue me from these sometimes very powerful, luring temptations. Yeah. You and clarify that. You clarify that so well if someone's thinking it's inevitable that I'm going to fail. It's inevitable that if I was in a position of leadership, uh, you know, I'll mess up somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the opposite's true. If I'm walking with him, it's inevitable that I'm going to be walking with him and desiring him that, and, and growing to love and enjoy and be satisfied him, by him more. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not inevitable that I'm going to fall into a pit of sin. Okay. Very yeah. true. Wow. Well, good discussion today. Man, there's, I'm sure there's a lot more we could talk about yeah. <laughs> and go on, but uh, we've been at this for a while, and, and we're glad that you've joined us in the discussion. And please, if you have any questions about this, you have any concerns about this, we would love for you to contact us. We'd love to be able to sit down and talk with you about this as well. Um, we've, we've emphasized discipleship. We've emphasized your walk with God, your relationship with God. And discipleship is, is people walking together in that. And I would encourage you to evaluate that in your own life. Is that a reality in your life? Or do you feel like you're just kind of living the Christian life all on your own? Um, that's, that's not what the church is about. We are called to be together and to walk together in a Godward direction. So I strongly urge you to pursue that passionately as we walk together in a Godward direction. But thank you for joining us today. And, and again, if you would like to talk about it, have some thoughts or have some questions, please contact us at the information that's provided. Thank you for joining us today.